the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this very special event today. And I want to thank Thomas Menino, Mayor of Boston, the Education Mayor, for being here with us today. And also David Marr, the new Mayor of Cambridge, Massachusetts, for joining us as well. And I, of course, want to thank all of you, deans, faculty, students, staff, for the work in organizing, organizing and also for being part of it here and in a number of remote sites where you are watching us on video. This is a very important moment for education in the United States, and we are really proud that one of our own is taking the leadership at this time. It is a complete pleasure to welcome Arne Duncan back to Harvard. The secretary graduated from Harvard College in 1986, and I had the pleasure of getting to know him during his time of service on the Board of Overseers from 2006 to 2009. Now he leads the federal department whose work is most closely related to our fundamental commitments here at Harvard. Under his direction, the Department of Education is for the first time really undertaking a systematic effort to incorporate into the national dialogue on education the findings and insights of places like this one, the Graduate School of Education, in order to support teachers and students in achieving substantial educational progress. Under Secretary Duncan, we are seeing a move towards very important incorporation of experimental and data-driven approaches that recognize and reward and replicate success. Now this important moment in education is also a critical moment here at the Graduate School of Education as it launches a very exciting new degree program, the Doctorate in Educational Leadership. This is a degree designed to educate practitioners with all the learning that is necessary to implement change and improvement in our educational environment. The mastermind of this degree and the very honored leader of this school is my very uh, cherished colleague, Kathy McCartney. So let us welcome her, please. Good afternoon, uh, President Faust. We have Provost Steve Hyman here. I'd also like to acknowledge Tom Menino, Boston's education mayor. And we have our newly elected mayor of Cambridge, David Marr. I am a Canterbridgean, so I'm looking forward to getting to know you. We have educators from across the sector. We have members of the Ed School community here. And we have about 300 other people listening on simulcast. I want to especially welcome our students who are listening across the university and special friends who are with us today. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this very special Ask With Forum with Arnie Duncan, the United States Secretary of Education. I have greetings from Massachusetts Secretary of Education Paul Revel, who is a member of our faculty. He's asked me to send his greetings, but also his regrets, because he is currently in New Orleans with three other members of the faculty um, at a conference on the future of school reform. So Arnie, they have a good excuse. <laughs> Today's event is co-sponsored by the Harvard chapter of Phi Delta Kappa. And Professor Monica Higgins, from our faculty, who's a member of their board, would like to say a few words. Thank you, Kathy. On behalf of Phi Delta Kappa, I welcome all of you, and I thank you, Secretary Duncan, so much for making your way through the snow and the rain and the sleet, and we give you a taste of all different aspects of New England weather to welcome you back home here to Harvard, and thank you, President Faust, for joining us, and for mayors and all of you. For those of you who don't know, Phi Delta Kappa is an intergenerational educational association whose mission is to promote high-quality education for all. High quality education, we believe, goes hand in hand with high quality democracy, 
And so this forum is a perfect venue for us to get together, for your voices to be heard, for you to have a chance to hear from Arnie and some of his, excuse me, Secretary Duncan, we call you Arnie around here. <laughs> uh, Secretary Duncan's latest thinking on education reform. Some of you may know Phi Delta Kappa uh, for our scholarly journal, which is called the Kappen, Phi Delta Kappen. Um, and actually, uh, just this last year, we featured an article on Secretary Duncan. But our belief is that one way to influence policy and practice is to engage in high quality scholarly research. And so this is one outlet in which we do that. So today, I'm going to be serving in the role as a moderator. So from that perspective, I thought I'd give you a little bit of the sense of the flow of the afternoon. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Dean McCartney. She will then introduce Secretary Duncan. Then Secretary Duncan will have 20 minutes or however long you would like uh, to address us. And then we will turn it back over to you all to listen to your questions. And at that point, I'll step back up on stage. I'll give you a little bit more of a sense of the framing for that part of the discussion. And then I'll turn it back over to Dean McCartney at the end to close, and we will adjourn at 4 o'clock. So right now, it's my pleasure to turn it back over to Dean McCartney. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> Twenty-seven years after the publication of A Nation at Risk, public education remains at a critical juncture. The challenges facing us are well documented and well known. We have high dropout race, rates in the largest school districts in our country, persistent achievement gaps, and barriers to innovation in the education sector. We're fortunate to have a true education reformer leading the Department of Education a person who is bringing his experience as a successful urban superintendent to his role as United States Secretary of Education. Secretary Arnie Duncan's career in education began in 1992 as the director of the Aerial Education Initiative, a program to enhance educational opportunities for children on the Chicago South Side. A mere nine years later, Duncan was appointed by Mayor Richard Daley to serve as CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. Under his leadership, the district made great gains. For example, he expanded early childhood education programs, near and dear to my heart. He expanded after school and summer programs. He expanded the number of charter schools. And results followed. Student test scores improved, especially in reading and math for elementary school students. Student student rates increased and college access increased. In announcing Duncan's nomination for Secretary of Education, President Obama said, for Arnie, school reform is not just a theory in a book, it is the cause of his life. In just a year, Duncan has set an ambitious and visionary course for public education. He's challenging all of us to think more critically about what we're doing and how to make a meaningful difference in student learning. Specifically, he's challenging schools of education to strengthen our teacher education programs. He's challenging districts to build relationships across boundaries. And he's even challenging the federal government to consider what its role in public education reform should be. And as we all know, He's leading an unprecedented investment in public education through the Department of Education Race to the Top program, which I suspect he'll say a few words about today. But perhaps most important, I know Arnie Duncan to be a person who puts children first and foremost in his work. He has described education as the only sure path out of poverty and the only way to achieve a more equal and just society, something we all believe here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Please join me in welcoming Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's really, really nice to be back here. I'm a huge fan of what President Faust is doing. I don't think the School of Education has ever been stronger. Uh, Mayor Menino is an absolute champion for children, and it's just fun to be a part of this community. So thank you so much for having me today. I thought I'd, I'd begin by just giving a little bit of a, a personal background on myself and I'll keep my remarks pretty brief and then open up to any questions you might have. 
I think we're all products of our environment, and I was extraordinarily fortunate to grow up in a pretty unique environment. Uh, grew up in the Hyde Park community of Chicago. Uh, my dad was a four decades long professor at the university there. Uh, went to laboratory schools, was a great, great school there, uh, K to 12, all the way through. And in the evenings, my mother ran an after school tutoring program in a neighborhood literally 10 blocks from where we lived, but just an entirely different community. There was a barrier between our middle class integrated neighborhood at Hyde Park and then the North Kenwood Oakland neighborhood. 47th Street was this barrier no one was supposed to pass. And she, in 1961, went down to teach a Bible study class, had a bunch of nine-year-old girls, tried to start to uh, uh, go through the Bible, and the kids couldn't read. And she said, something's wrong with this picture when you have nine-year-olds who can't read. You've got to do something about that. So it was a fascinating upbringing for me, my sister, and my brother and the chance to go to a phenomenal school during the day, the chance to grow up as a part of my mother's tutoring program in the evenings, and she had this philosophy where the 10-year-olds taught the 5-year-olds and the 15-year-olds taught the 10-year-olds. We were being taught and teaching others all the way through. But every day we were hit with the tremendous inequities of opportunity that we had going to school where we went and where the children from this community went. And so often what I felt we were doing or trying to do from 3 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the evening was make up for, for what wasn't happening during the school day that these children happened to all be poor, happened to often not come from the most functional families, uh, came from a very, very violent community. But just in a small group of guys I grew up with as part of my tutoring program, the guy who led our group was a neighborhood teenager, is now one of IBM's 50 leaders worldwide. Um, another guy is Mar Michael Clark Duncan, who started in the Green Mile in Hollywood. Uh, another one, Quirky Lines, is literally a brain surgeon today. One more, Ronald Raglan, helped me uh, manage the Chicago Public Schools. So from one little corner at 46 in Greenwood, because my mother was there and there were other people who cared about kids and stuck with them and uh, gave them a real opportunity and had the highest expectations, you saw these extraordinary success stories. And I worried so much about the kids that didn't have those kinds of opportunities and how much potential was lost. And so this battle's been a very, very personal one uh, for me all the way through. I was so lucky to the school let me sneak in the back door somehow uh, and uh, have a chance again to, to get a great world-class <laughs> education and be exposed to the ideas here. Once I graduated from here, I played basketball for a couple years overseas and then came back to uh, set up a nonprofit for a friend of mine and to try and build upon my mother's work. We did a couple things. We ran an I Have a Dream program where we took 40 students in sixth grade and promised them if they made it through high school, we'd pay for their college education. So that was my job for six years, from 1992 to 1998, along with my sister and a set of volunteers. And uh, the students in our class, 87% graduated from high school. The students in the class one year ahead of ours from the same elementary school had a 67% dropout rate. So 87% high school graduation versus 67% dropout rate. Same kids, same neighborhoods, same socioeconomic challenges, same issues around violence but very different opportunity structure. And what we were trying to demonstrate in a concrete way was the lessons we had learned from my mother's program all those years that with real opportunity, students can be extraordinarily successful. We started a small public school in that, uh, right across the street from my mother's program called Aerial Community Academy. We wanted to demonstrate that you could in inner city communities have educational excellence. And that school, I'm very proud to report, is now one of the highest performing schools in Chicago. Neighborhood school, again, huge poverty rate, uh, but high expectations, great talent, folks doing very, very well. And so uh, after that, I was lucky enough to leave the Chicago Public Schools for seven and a half years before coming to Washington. So my, uh, it's an interesting journey, but it, it always, always sort of goes back to uh, the heart of the opportunities I and my sister and brother had and the opportunities I thought so many of our friends didn't have and how do we start to uh, equalize the opportunity structure around the country. This first year in Washington has been an amazing one, and it's flown by. It's, a, it's been unbelievable. We were lucky enough to walk in and have our budget double, and uh, that doesn't happen in universities. Uh, that definitely didn't happen when I ran a nonprofit. It doesn't happen on the corporate side, but thanks to the president's leadership and Congress's bipartisan support, we had a hundred billion dollar increase in funding first year. Staggering opportunity. Uh, we have huge challenges. We, as you guys know, have toughest economy in decades. Um, we were able in the first year to save about a minimum of 300,000 teachers jobs around the country. We were very, very concerned about class sizes skyrocketing and laying off librarians and social workers and counselors. That would have been an absolute education catastrophe. Um, we were able to stave that off largely. There were still very difficult cuts, very difficult layoffs. I'm actually very worried about this next school year, but a huge effort to try and save jobs, but also a chance to really try and drive reform. 
And what you're going to hear from me constantly is that we have to get dramatically better. That where we're at today is not good enough for our nation's children, it's not good enough for our cities and states, and it's not good enough for our nation's economy. We have to educate our way to a better economy. And in this first year, we've seen, um, thanks to competitive resources, thanks to states and mayors and school superintendents stepping up to plate, we've seen extraordinary progress. You have 48 states uh, governors, 48 state school chiefs working together behind common standards. This was the third rail in education a few years ago, and some folks here might not think it's the best of ideas, but I'll, I'll talk about it more. But I think we have to have a high bar for every child. The idea of having 50 different goalposts doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And to see this leadership coming at the local level has, has been huge. We've seen over a dozen states start to remove structural impediments, laws that inhibited innovation. And so I'm a fan not of charter schools, but of good charter schools. I'm a fan of more quality schools, particularly in neighborhoods that have been underserved. And you've seen those laws start to go away. Uh, one thing I didn't anticipate, didn't know, that we actually had states that prohibited, there were laws on the books that prohibited the linking of teacher evaluation and student performance. It was a fascinating one for me. And <laughs> the, the statement, I interpreted that, is what it basically said is that great teaching doesn't matter. And that teachers don't make a difference or can't make a difference in students' lives. It's irrelevant. You just put any old adult in front of a group of kids and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And I fundamentally disagree with that. I think great teachers make an extraordinary difference in students' lives. I think great principals make a huge difference. And we need to at least start to understand what those adults are doing to help students be successful, particularly in very tough uh, situations. And so we saw those data firewalls start to come down. It's a very, very significant breakthrough. As we move into the second year, uh, really aggressive agenda, have to build upon the first year and have to get dramatically better. A couple of numbers, and everyone here knows this. Uh, we have a dropout rate in this country of about 27%. That's 1.2 million students every single year leaving our schools for the streets. And everyone here knows there's no good jobs in today's economy for a high school dropout, none. I was talking about you know, Chicago 30 years ago, there actually was an acceptable dropout rate. You could drop out and go work in the stockyards, the steel mills, own your own home, support a family, have a good job. Those jobs are a distant memory from a bygone era. We have to dramatically reduce the dropout rate. We have to dramatically increase the graduation rate. And we have to dramatically increase the number of high school graduates that are actually prepared to do college level work. We have some studies that show that as many as 60% of high school graduates have to take remedial classes. They're actually not prepared because standards have been dummied down so much. So that fundamentally has to change. The president has drawn a line in the sand. He said by 2020, we have to again lead the world in the percent of college graduates. Some folks think we still lead the world. We did two, two and a half decades ago. It's pretty interesting, we've actually flatlined. About 40% of our 25 to 30 year, 34 year olds have a uh, college diploma, four year, two year, doesn't matter. We've been at 40%. Many other countries have passed us by. And I think we're paying the price for it economically. So that's the bar, that's what we're seeking to hit. Um, I think we have an absolute economic imperative to get better. And I absolutely see education as the civil rights issue of our generation. I think the dividing line in our country today is less around race and socioeconomic status than it is around education opportunity. That if children, again, from poor communities have access to a great elementary school and a great high school and can go to a good university, good community college, they're going to do very, very well. But children that don't have those opportunities, I'm worried, I'm actually convinced, are basically condemned to poverty and to social failure. And so whether you look at this from a moral imperative whether you look at this from an economic imperative, I think the only way we get there as a country is through quality education. So we're going to continue to push very, very hard. How do we get there? Th three areas we're working on have to look at the entire continuum. Uh, have to start at early childhood, early childhood education, something very, very close to your heart, and your work has been phenomenal. And again, some of this is based upon research. Some of this is based upon watching what my mother could do when she got a child when, she was, when the child was two versus when that child was 12. And if we can get to our babies, if we can level the playing field before children enter kindergarten, then I'm convinced we can go a long way towards closing the achievement gap. It's very interesting if you look at the data over uh, a child's elementary career. career middle, uh, middle class children improve academically. Poor children improve academically. The problem is poor children never catch up. This gap just continues in many places, actually grows, gets exacerbated. So we in education have to get out of the catch up business. I think the only way we get out of the catch-up business is through great early childhood programs. We want to invest almost $10 billion over the next 10 years, about a billion dollars a year to do th two things, to dramatically increase access, particularly in disadvantaged communities, 
and then to dramatically increase quality. If this is glorified babysitting, it doesn't get us where we need to go. If these are very high quality programs and students enter kindergarten ready to learn and ready to read with their socialization and literacy skills intact, they have a chance to be very successful. And we're pushing very hard to see that happen. Secondly, K-12 education, that next step on the journey. There are a couple principles that were put in place for Race to the Top that we're going to continue to come back to. Uh, first, we think we have to have high standards. In uh, far too many states, due to political pressure, not due to what's good educationally, not due to what's good economically for the state, standards have been dumbing down. That's true from the state that I'm from, from, from Illinois. And so what we have to do is raise the bar, have college-ready, career-ready standards for everyone. I think Massachusetts has done absolutely as well as anybody at having a very rigorous, bigger, uh, high bar. And as I said, this used to be the third rail. Couldn't use to talk about this. We had this tremendous leadership from 48 states. The heads of both national unions, the AFT and NEA, are absolutely on board in supporting this. The business community has been crying out for this for a long time. So this is really an idea whose, whose time has come. After you set a high bar, you have to make sure you're getting talent to the communities that have been, that have been historically underserved. So how do we systematically think about getting great teachers, great principals to communities that have been underserved? That might be inner city urban, that might be rural. I'm just convinced in education, talent matters tremendously. How do we figure out who the best teachers are, the best principals are, the hardest working, and get them to the communities that haven't had them? We talk so much about the achievement gap, I'm convinced the only way we close the achievement gap is by closing what I call the opportunity gap. In our country, there have been very few incentives and many disincentives to get the hardest working, the most committed to the communities that need the most help. And we want to put a huge amount of resources behind an effort to uh, correct that imbalance. And again, if we do that, I think we'll see very, very different things happen. Third, we just want to be transparent around data. So we want to track students' education trajectory throughout their academic career. And what really bothers me is there are students who work hard and get good grades, but due to low standards and due to not really knowing what's going on, uh, they get to that junior senior year and they get a 14 or they get a 15 on the ACT. They have not been fully prepared. And a student, not just as a junior or senior, but as a third grader, as a fifth grader, as an eighth grader, they should know their strengths, they should know their weaknesses, we should be helping them improve, parents should be challenged to help out, and the more we can be absolutely transparent about what's working and what's not, the better we can do. I always cite, uh, you talked about your folks in New Orleans, um, I talk about the Louisiana example. Louisiana's data system is a pretty interesting one. In Louisiana, they've tracked the records of hundreds of thousands of students. They've tracked those records back to tens of thousands of teachers. And then they've tracked the students' progress, their growth, back to the teachers, and then their, the teachers back to their schools of education. So in Louisiana, they know what schools of education are producing the teachers that are producing the students. They're doing either great or not so great in a variety of different subjects. And what you have is schools of education actually in real time starting to change and increase rigor in their curriculum based upon the results of their, their alumni, students. So it's about continual improvement. It's not about gotcha. It's not about trying to get anyone. It's about how do you continue to get, to get better. It makes absolute logical sense to me. We have one state, one state out of 50 who, who have taken that step. And they don't have some patent on some magical technology. <laughs> um, this is not about a technological breakthrough. This isn't about a massive investment in new data systems. This is about having the courage to say that adults make a great difference in students' lives. We want to understand what, how those adults are doing to accelerate growth, to accelerate gain. And then where it's working great, let's learn those lessons. Where it's not working, let's do something very different. And then the final principle we're going to push very, very hard is to think about different types of schools. Uh, under No Child Left Behind, one of my uh, real concerns is that great schools weren't identified. There are like 50 ways to fail and very few ways to succeed. I think there are a set of very high performing schools in this district, in the, not in, sorry, in this district, in this country that we need to learn from, we need to get out of the way, we need to give them flexibility, we need to give them lots of room to move. There are a set of schools in the middle that might not be world class yet, but are getting to that point and we need to help them continue to improve. But I've challenged the country to think about not the 99% of schools. We have about 100,000 schools in this country. So not the 99,000 schools, but the bottom 1%, the bottom 1,000. And can we as a country do something very different when despite the best of intentions, despite hard work, things simply aren't working for children? Let me tell you why I think this is so important. I talked about a 27% dropout rate and uh, sort of the, the, the epidemic that, that I think that, that, uh, that, that uh, creates. 
We have 2,000 high schools in our country, not that many, 2,000 high schools that produce half of our nation's dropouts, 50%. Those 2,000 high schools produce almost 75% of our dropouts from the minority community, our African-American, Latino, young boys and girls. That is just morally unacceptable to me. And in far too many places, that situation hasn't been true for a year or two years or five years, but often for decades, 10, 20, 30 years. And I don't see how we break cycles of poverty if we don't, in poor communities, provide a great education. This, to me, is the anti-poverty program. And so what we're asking folks to think about is not just the 99%, but that water, bottom 1%. And can we have the courage to come in and do something very, very differently and do it with a real sense of urgency? And this work is tough. It is hard. It is controversial. But in a small number of places around the country, we've seen extraordinary results. I was in a school in Philadelphia not too long ago where before they turned that school around, it was the second most violent school in the city. Uh, test scores were horrendous. Uh, two years later, they have almost no violence, and 85% of students are meeting state standards, from about 24% to 85%. And I asked, uh, I asked one of the students, you know, what changed here? And it was really profound what he said. He, I said, well, you know, what used to happen? He said, you used to fight all the time. I said, why did you fight all the time? He said, we were expected to fight. We were expected to fight. And uh, I said, what did you fight about? He said, we, we used to fight about some really stupid things. <laughs> I said, what changed now? He said, we're not expected to fight anymore. Same kids, same challenges, different adults, different expectations, entirely different culture, dramatic progress in a short period of time. Not 20 years for change, not 30 years for change, two years, three years, very, very quick. So if we can think about those principles, high standards for every child, clear data systems, transparency, thinking about great talent, and thinking about being tough-minded with low-performing schools and doing things differently, we think we can break through. All of that is to what end? All of that is to get more students into college and prepare to be successful. Four-year universities, two-year community colleges, trade, technical, vocational training, doesn't matter what it is, some form of higher education has to be the goal for every single one of our students. We've tried to do a number of things and want to continue to work very hard to do this. One of them was simplified, simplified the FAFSA form dramatically. Uh, that form itself, for those of you who have filled it out or filled it out for your children, um, I think you often need a PhD to fill it out. And most 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds going to college don't have their PhDs yet. And the form itself is a huge barrier, huge impediment. So we've tried to make that much, much simpler. Secondly, we've tried to put a huge amount of money to make college much more affordable. As everyone here knows, a time when going to college has never been more expensive, it's never been more important, and our nation's families have never been under more financial duress. So we're trying to put tens of billions of dollars behind Pell Grants and Perkins loans and tuition tax credits. And I don't worry just about the juniors and seniors trying to go now. I worry a lot about the 9 and 10 year olds who are smart, who are working hard, but mom or dad loses a job or takes a 50% pay cut, and those dreams start to die. They start to think college isn't for them. And you may have seen the national survey that came out about two weeks ago that talked about so many American families feel disconnected from higher education. They feel it's for rich folks. They don't feel it's for them. And we have to fundamentally change that and make sure that students have access. Then finally, once they graduate, we have to push universities very hard to make sure we're not just taking students in, but graduating them. We put a lots of money on the table behind building college uh, cultures around completion, around attainment, not just access. We've worked very hard to put in place a system called income-based repayment, IBR. And what has already passed, and this passed July 1st, was that we will limit loan repayments once you graduate to 15% of, of your income, 15% every month. And we're trying to take that down to 10%. And then if you work in the public service for 10 years, all those loans will be erased. So great teachers. If you want to open up a legal aid clinic in the inner city or rural area, if you want to open up a, a medical clinic, I think we've lost far too great talent into the public sector. And obviously, I'm biased. We want that next generation of great teachers. There are many folks who wanted to go into those, those fields but simply couldn't afford to do it. They had loans of sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 and could not afford to follow their heart and follow their passion. And we're trying to remove those, those impediments. So if we can do all those things that the higher ed, said, uh, higher ed side, continue to improve access, make sure students are graduating, put money behind universities that want to do things differently, and then help make, let, allow them to pursue their dreams once they graduate, I think we start to turn this thing around. We have to push in all these areas very, very hard. And we've been critiqued by some, fair enough, that this is too ambitious an agenda. We're trying to do too much. And I tell you, I would love to spend the next two or three years just thinking about early childhood education, or just thinking about K-12, or just thinking about higher ed. I don't think we have that luxury. 
I think we have to get better in all these areas. I think we have to do it with a real sense of urgency. And we'll continue to you know, work with those critics, but let folks know that in every area, we need fundamental and dramatic change. I go back to why this is so important. I went back to Chicago on, on Tuesday to, to do some work and stop my mother's program and to see what the 65 children she works with, to see what the opportunity they have every day to be successful and to see that despite the challenges they're facing, I'm extraordinarily hopeful about what they're going to accomplish. I don't think any of us can rest or should rest until every child in this country has an opportunity to go to a great school. I think in our country we've been good about creating schools that were good enough for somebody else's children. We haven't been good enough about creating schools that were good enough for our own children. And so this work has to be very, very personal. Uh, my wife and I have two young kids at home, a uh, six-year-old and an eight-year-old. As I visit schools around the country, I've been to 37 states, my constant question is, is would I send my own child to the school? And if I would send my own child to the school, that's a great school. If I wouldn't do it, that's a school that needs to improve. And as this work becomes more and more personal for us, when we talk about not someone else's kids, but our kids, as we see this as the civil rights challenge of our generation, as we see the sense of economic imperative that we have to educate our way to a better economy, we all have to challenge each other, we have to work together, but we all have to move out, outside our comfort zones. And if we do this, we have a chance to fundamentally break through. We've never had a president that is so passionate on the issue. He wasn't born of a silver spoon in his mouth raised by his grandparents part of the time. Dad disappeared pretty early in life on welfare at times. The first lady, Michelle Obama, great, great family. I've known them for years, phenomenal parents. Neither one has a college degree. Education's a passion for them. Uh, for all the craziness you hear coming out of Washington, education is the one issue that you've seen absolute bipartisan work. And I've been traveling <coughs> around the country with my good friends, Reverend Al Sharpton and Newt Gingrich. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you're allowed to laugh. <laughs> and there's some humor in that, in that. We have some fascinating conversations. But we're trying to demonstrate in a real way that people who don't agree on almost anything in life <laughs> agree that we have to improve educationally. And for all the debates we've seen, you may have seen two weeks ago, hopefully saw that coming out of the, the House of Representatives was the, the two leaders, Republican and Democrat, bipartisan, George Miller, Representative Klein, saying we're going to work together around ESEA reauthorization. And so moving outside our comfort zones, having courage to make the tough calls, continuing to work with real heart and passion, and putting aside egos and ideology, ideology and politics, big challenges, but an opportunity of a lifetime. I look forward to working together with all of you to make sure every child has a chance to get a great education. I'll stop there, and I'll take any questions you might have. Okay, um, thank you so much, Secretary Duncan. Now it's your turn. I'll turn it over to you to hear what your questions are. Um, so I'm sure what uh, Secretary Duncan just said inspired some questions, but I know some of you came in with questions. And I know many of you in the audience here, but since uh, Secretary Duncan doesn't know you and most of you don't know each other, what I'm going to ask you to do is just to briefly state your name and your affiliation, not your full background and career history, okay? <laughs> and then get straight to your one question. So even if you have five, you're going to need to choose one, right? And not one with five parts, and not a comment with an uptick at the end, like it's lousy weather. Yes, it is. OK, so for example, my name is Monica Higgins, faculty, Harvard Graduate School of Education, Phi Delta Kappa. Here's my one question for Secretary Duncan. OK, we also have the opportunity, since there's an overflow room, we have an opportunity to receive questions via tweet. So, yes, we do. And so um, every once in a while, I'm going to head over to Jessica, who's in the back of the room, and we'll get a question from the overflow room. So um, without further ado, who's the brave soul who would like to ask the first question? Yes, Jenny. I do know who you are. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jenny Weiner, and I'm a doctoral student here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And actually, my question's about race to the top, and particularly about the fact that, of course, unprecedented resources to help school districts reform public education. Um, but in the applications, often contentious issues, um, things that have not yet been proven at scale, um, sometimes mixed results in terms of uh, the outcomes. 
So given that, how do you balance uh, the need for expediency around these issues and making sure that the interventions are actually sustainable, high quality, and have community support? Let me give you a good example is the Turnaround Initiative. That uh, as a country, I say we do lots of things on the academic calendar. We hire people every year, uh, K to 12. We pay for milk. We hire buses. We order textbooks. As a country, we don't turn around chronic and underperforming schools. Not what we do. Some interesting, you know, very interesting uh, pilots. I talked about one example in Philadelphia. There, there are others, but at scale, we don't do this. So I've talked about I would like to turn around a thousand schools a year. The bottom one percent. I think you can make a pretty compelling case that we should be more aggressive than that. But what I said repeatedly is honestly, we don't have the capacity to do that well. So I'm much less interested in quantity. So whether it's 256 or whether it's 351, I want us as a country to start to turn around some schools this fall. And then every year we'll learn from that. And we'll make some, you know, we'll make some mistakes. Not everything's going to go well. But where we have dropout rates of 50, 60, 7 percent, <laughs> I would argue we've done nothing for far too long. And let's try this, let's get in it, let's learn what works and what doesn't. There's never one right answer. And the big thing we've tried to do, the balance we've tried to hit in uh, Race to Top and other things is saying the status quo isn't good enough, but the good ideas are never going to come from Washington, They're never going to come from us. It's always going to come from great teachers and great principals in the local level. The advantage or the huge opportunity we have that I think folks are starting to understand is whether it's Race to the Top, which is $4 billion, which has gotten all the, the press and publicity, but school improvement grants, $3.5 billion, <laughs> invest in innovation fund, $650 million. All we want to do is put huge resources behind those states, those districts, those nonprofits, those universities. They're doing two things, raising the bar for all children and closing the achievement gap. So we don't have to come up with the good ideas. I always say that you know, before I went to Washington, I think they had all the good ideas. Now I'm wa in Washington, I know they don't have all the good ideas. <laughs> The good ideas are always going to come from places like this. And what we can do is take the scale that works. For all the challenges I talked about, we've never had so many examples of success around the country. We've never had so many high-performing schools. What we just don't have yet is we don't have them at scale. And so if we can take these islands of excellence, these pockets of excellence, and take them to scale, then we break through. Hello, I'm Karen Babcock. Good, good to see Secretary you. Duncan. I have to get used to that, too. Um, I want to ask you a question. I'm a faculty member here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and also a, a former proud member of the Boston Public Schools um, in terms of uh, their administration. And so we've heard you and President Obama talk a lot about the importance of family engagement in their children's education. And so, and I thank you very much um, for your call and the President's call to integrate family engagement into the 21st century learning centers and safe and healthy and successful students programming in the uh, 2011 budget. However, uh, the budget also signals that the Parental Information Resource Centers, the PERCs, uh, as they are well known by that name, will be eliminated through the ESEA reauthorization. So my question is, how does the department plan to integrate and coordinate family engagement initiatives and support grantees and families uh, encouraging and enhancing their capacity to be involved in their children's education if the federal government eliminates the sole federal program dedicated to providing capacity, training, and technical assistance to schools, communities-based or community-based organizations and districts to effectively engage families. It's a, it's a great question. Just appreciate your hard work so much. What we try to do is historically I sort of challenge everyone to move outside their comfort zones and do things differently. I've tried to be very honest and say that I think the Department of Education has been part of the problem. We've been this big compliance-driven agency, and we're trying to fundamentally change how we do business and become this, innova this engine of innovation and just scale up best practices. And as hard as we're pushing everybody else to change, I promise you we're trying to look in the mirror every single day and be very, very self-critical. So we're making a number of changes um, in, in how we do things. First of all, we used to run many, many different programs. We've tried to consolidate them. Rather than doing 60 different things, trying to cut that down to a manageable number, we have sort of six major areas that we're trying to push. The one that I think, Ken, is most interesting uh, to you is around making sure students have an opportunity to be successful. So whether it's parental engagement, whether it's school safety, uh, the Promise Neighborhoods Initiative we have, which is trying to replicate Jeffrey Canada's work in the Harlem Children's Zone and making sure that students have a, a culture and a climate around the school building to be successful. And we tried to make sort of six large, huge bets and to put that money out on a competitive basis. 
and that's ruffled some feathers. We're doing some things differently. I just think if we continue just to, to, to uh, fund on a formulaic basis, we perpetuate the status quo. And there's going to be huge opportunities, Karen, for great programs that demonstrate that it's ma they're making a difference in students' lives to, to build upon what they're doing and actually get many more resources. And so we've eliminated earmarks, which has uh, angered folks on both sides of the aisle. Um, we've, in all these areas, because we got new money, we're basically, besides the VA, the only domestic agency to get new resources. But what's said is that we're no longer just going to hand that out. If you can, again, demonstrate to us that student achievement is going up and achievement gaps are closing, then we want to put a lot of resources behind that. I will say one of the areas that we're really struggling, and I'd love to get your thoughts at some point, is we think about ESA reauthorization is how do we hold parents more accountable for, for success. And we have to challenge students. Parents have to be part of the answer. Parents have to be engaged. You know I'm a huge fan of community centers and making schools the centers of the neighborhood. Um, but we have to find ways to really uh, ask parents to step up to the plate. And you know, how you do that thoughtfully, how you create incentives for them to do that. There's uh, been some really interesting work in Mexico. And uh, Mayor Bloomberg has tried to do some things in New York that we're watching. And uh, there's some ways to create incentives to really engage parents. In far too many places, uh, schools, frankly, are sort of scared of parents. They don't want them in the door, sort of drop the kids off, leave. And I think that's a huge missed opportunity. And how do we start to change that culture? How do we open the doors? How do we make parents full and equal uh, partners? And how do we hold parents accountable for being part of the solution, particularly in the teenage years? I worry a lot about parents sort of abdicating their responsibility when their children start to turn 12, 13, 14. Uh, one of the things we try to do in Chicago is we'd survey our students every single year and ask what's working, what's not, and do you feel safe, and are the high expectations in every school and track that data. One of the most heartbreaking things is uh, a huge percent of our teenagers who we interviewed, our high school students, one of the things they're most asking for is more time with their parents. And they, were, they you know, people think adolescents want all this freedom, want all the, you know, our kids were asking. That was, you know, one of the highest items that we, you know, they sort of challenged us to help them get better on. And so we're trying to think a lot about that at some point. I'd love to pick your brain on that. Hi, question, Tori Duncan. Uh, Paul Toner from the Massachusetts Teachers Association. Uh, very happy to hear all your comments. I agree with many of the things you uh, have said here today. Uh, I just want to ask you if you could talk a little bit about your philosophy of labor management relationships in districts and schools. And I would like to ask you if you could possibly today clarify some, I hope, misquotes in the Providence Journal about the firing of 93 teachers in Central Falls, Rhode Island, where you're uh, quoted as applauding a strong action. And I'd like to give you a chance to talk about that. Okay, sure, I appreciate your leadership. And I, uh, I know how hard you've worked on these issues. When I talk about folks moving outside their comfort zones and working together, labor management is at the heart of that. And as you know, what we tried to do in Race the Top and other things is ask what are folks doing to collaborate behind these reforms. And if it, this is top-down management and teachers and unions aren't involved, I think it's not going to work. And so we try to do everything we can to push everybody. And I think lots of folks lots of want to you know, point fingers, but I think all of us have to do things differently. I talked about we have to do differently. I think school boards have to behave differently. I think superintendents have to behave differently. And teachers and unions have to behave differently and, and come together. I never once said, just to be very, very clear, I never once said it's great that we fired a bunch of teachers. I didn't applaud that. What I said is that we have to have the courage to challenge the status quo when things aren't working. And how that plays out at the local level, that's not for us to decide on what to do. What I was applauding was the courage to say this is a school where the dropout rate is higher, it's like 53%, so more than half the students aren't graduating. And that number's getting worse, not better. And so no one wants to fire teachers. That's not you know, any, something anyone takes pride in doing. But that school and that school district, and I challenge the union, have to say, what do we do when at the end of the day it's not working? It's interesting. I talked to some folks, and they said, well, it's a poor community. What do you expect? And so there are, you know, folks' expectations of poor communities are so low. And I said, if you want that poor community not to be a poor community anymore, what's the only answer? The students have to graduate. They have to graduate and go to college. And so I'm very hopeful. Um, as we speak, I've been staying close, I think. Union and management is finally sitting down and, and, and talking, and I'm hopeful they'll continue to talk and figure something out. But we have to, as a country, we haven't talked about schools where chronically, year after year, 50, 60, 7 percent of students drop out. We haven't had the courage to have those conversations. And I'm pushing all of us, management, school boards, and unions, to say, let's deal with this openly and honestly, and let's do something be very better, uh, much better for those children in those communities. Thank you for that question. Yes. So this is. This is a tweet. Tweeted question. This is a new one for me. <laughs> there we go. There we go. 
Thank you. How can special ed teachers in balancing standards-based reform and individualized education be supported and held accountable? Great question. I think as we think about ESEA reauthorization, two of the toughest ones we have to get right is what you do for students with special needs and what you do for English language learners. I'll say big picture, one of the big problems I had with No Child Left Behind was it focused too much on an absolute test score and not enough on growth and gain and how much the student's improving. Let me explain what I mean and I'll come spe specifically to your question. If Paul is a fifth grade teacher and I come to him reading at a first grade level, if I leave his class reading at the fourth grade level, on a No Child Left Behind, he's a failure. If I improve three grade levels or two grade levels or a grade level and a half under his instruction, I think not only is he not a bad teacher, I think he's a phenomenal teacher. I think he's an absolute hero. And so what we want to do much more going forward is look at growth and gain and how much a student's improving. A school might have a graduation rate that's low, but that graduation rate is getting better. That tells you one thing. <laughs> that graduation rate is going south. That tells you something else. The needle we have to, uh, we have to try and uh, thread properly, and I put both these uh, two different uh, groups of students in the same category, are special education students and ELL students. The two extremes, neither one works, is if you say we abdicate any responsibility. Students can't learn, and obviously that would be a total disaster. The flip side is that if you're giving an assessment that students literally can't read and can't comprehend. So those are the two things that neither one works. We have to find a way to uh, have assessments that are developmentally appropriate. We have to find a way to make sure, uh, for, you know, ELL students that we're testing sometimes in their native languages. So if the test is on English, if they can't read English, how are they going to pass that test? They can't do that, but we can still figure out what they know. And so we're working very, very hard um, with, with uh, real leaders in, in those two communities, and it's a balancing act, but I'm convinced we can get there. The larger issue, which, which you're not asking about, Ray, is that I think we have to get away from just thinking about special education teachers. I think every teacher today has to be a teacher of special education. And as we try and do much more inclusion, as we try and integrate, <laughs> It's always sort of us versus them, special ed versus regular ed or gen ed, and often the special ed teachers and special ed students are in the basements and in the cupboards and in the corridors, and that fundamentally has to change. So if every teacher becomes a teacher of special education, uh, schools of education start to do a better job of preparing that next generation of teachers, um, I think there's a real opportunity there. Terrific, thank you. Kevin and I are gonna pop on a question, if that's okay. Great. I am Kevin. Friends, a student here at the education school building of Khan. What do you just said? I wanted to get your feedback on merit pay and how that model may serve to segregate students with disabilities who have low test scores. Yeah. And I guess building off Kevin's question, um, it seems a lot of the major initiatives have been competitive in nature, including merit-based pay, including race to the top, pitting states against each other, um, and also charter schools um, being pitted against uh, traditional public schools for limited funds. Um, and it seems that there's a limited amount of um, a research base to support competitive initiatives in um, education as opposed to a, a collaborative um, initiatives and um, spreading a knowledge base and, and to speak to Kevin's uh, point to get teachers to work together to educate all of our students. So I'm wondering why most of the initiatives are going in the competitive direction rather than the collaborative direction. Let me uh, take the big, qu big question first and, and then uh, go forward. What we try to do is where you have Title I dollars or IDA dollars, those will continue to be formula based. Continue to be, and that, that's never going to change. People thought we were going to change all that and I assure you it never, never occurred to us. What we are saying though, and to me it's really less about competition, it's more about courage and capacity. And folks see that. So on Race to the Top, we're not going to invest in states that have the fanciest PowerPoint presentation. We're going to invest in people who have demonstrated the ability to collaborate, to work together, who have gotten results for children and want to get dramatically better results. And so it's much less, folks see the competition between states, 
That's not how we viewed it at all. Some folks are very, very serious about this, and some folks aren't. Some folks feel a sense of urgency, and some don't. On uh, charter schools, I've said repeatedly, I'm not a fan of charter schools, I'm a fan of good charter schools. And bad charter schools are part of the problem, good charter schools are part of the solution. Charter schools are public schools, it's our children, it's our tax dollars, they're accountable to us. And we'll always say at the end of the day, I think what folks don't understand is a first grader or a second grader, they don't know if they go to a charter school or a gifted school or a magnet school or a regular school. Am I safe? Does my teacher care about me? Am I learning? Our country just needs more good schools. Good charter schools are helping us do that in, in historically underserved communities. Bad charter schools need to be shut down. I opened a lot of charter schools in Chicago, some of which were phenomenally successful. I closed three for failure. What we want to do is just have more schools where children have a chance to be successful. And again, it's not about competition, it's just about challenging the status quo. And uh, I always said, you know, I wasn't that I was pro-charter schools, is that I had parents waiting lists of literally for the city, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 parents asking for something. If there was no demand, wouldn't open it. Money follows a child, not a competition. But if parents are looking for something better, if there's a tremendous unmet demand, I think we have to listen to parents. What well, I often think, you just go back, I often think what works for wealthy children and wealthy families in our country probably works pretty well for poor families. And wealthy families in our country have had two, three, four great educational options to choose from for years, for centuries. Poor families have often had one choice, and that choice wasn't a great one. So if we can create great schools in historically underserved communities of every kind of form and fashion, we should be replicating great charters, we should be replicating great district schools. We should be closing bad charters, we should be closing bad district schools. We need more success in whatever form or fashion that looks like. On the merit pay specifically, many merit programs, merit pay programs have failed. Why have they failed? They failed because they're done to teachers, not with them. They failed because it's pitted teachers against each other. And it's exactly the opposite. You want to build a sense of collaboration. So let me tell you how we did in Chicago. One of the best things the previous administration, Secretary Spellings did, they gave us a huge grant to do this. We had 25 of the best teachers in Chicago public schools, 25 out of 25,000, actually designed a program that was much more thoughtful and sophisticated than me. We only went to schools where 75% of teachers wanted it. Teachers had to vote on it. We had money for 20 schools. We had 120 schools show interest. And we did it so that every adult in the school benefited. So it's not pitting three teachers in the hallway against each other, which again creates all the wrong incentives, but not just teachers, but custodians, security guards, lunchroom attendants, principals, every adult. When you go to high-performing schools, it's every adult in the building building the culture. And then to answer your question directly, if you focus on absolute test scores, you create all the wrong incentives. But listen to what I keep saying. We're focused on growth and gain. How much are we improving? And so whether it's children with disabilities, whether it's English language learners, whether it's gifted students, whether it's students behind, every student can learn and grow. And so if you're focused on growth, you, you take away those perverse incentives and put in place the right incentives. So if you focus on teamwork, if you focus on building a culture, and you focus on growth and gain, then I think you reward it. Final thing I'll say is no one goes into education to make a million dollars. That's not what motivates teachers. It's not what motivates principals. They want to make a difference in students' lives. This to me is like a small token of our appreciation for saying thanks for the hard work. And if we can shine a spotlight in excellence and learn from that excellence, I think there's some very important lessons there. And so this is a small piece of a puzzle. But I think the flip side is that I think in education, we've been scared to talk about excellence. And I'm not sure why that is. We've been scared to talk about how important great teachers and great principals are in changing students' lives. And I want to shine a spotlight on those, on those people who are heroes. Not again, not based on just high performing kids, but where we're seeing tremendous growth. And we're seeing it all over the country. Those are the lessons I want to learn. Thank you. John Reedy, Visiting Committee uh, to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, the other night, Jonathan Kozol, whom I'm sure you know of, if not personally, uh, concluded a fairly uh, strong presentation by saying, in the final analysis, if the uh, city of Weston has 20,000 uh, per student to spend and the city of Haverhill with lots of Latino and Laotian and blacks has seven or 8,000, there's no way that you're really going to get equality. And he said, in the final analysis, we've got to crack this uh, colonial spending, states get the money from local property yeah. taxes, and it goes back. I mean, clearly, if it was all funded by the federal government, uh, it would be 
different, but can we gradually break down these uh, differences? It's a great, great question, and the mayor here, Carol Johnson, I think she's doing a phenomenal job here in Boston, has strong feeling this. I'll just say for this one, uh, this one's very personal for me. Let me give you, Illinois, I worked in Chicago. Illinois was 49th out of 50 states in the percent of money going to public education, and we were 43rd in the disparities between wealthy districts and poor districts. So my district, which was 90% minority and 85% low income, got less than half the money of wealthy school districts five miles from me on the north. So those children that had you know, two parent working families, strong support, had twice as much money, more than twice as much money every single year than I had to work with. And if we're trying to level the playing field, if education is supposed to be the great equalizer, there's something fundamentally un-American, something fundamentally inequitable about that. And so it's something we have to challenge. Um, this is a challenging time to talk about it. Nobody wants more taxes. <laughs> Families are absolutely stretched. I will say, folks, also, it's sort of a chicken or egg thing, so we can sit back and say we can never get there. <laughs> or you have other folks saying that they don't see enough return for their investment. And so what I'm trying to do is, with scarce resources, drive as much change as I can, leverage my scarce dollars to, to get dramatically better results. I think if we can demonstrate dramatically better results for children, folks might be willing to invest more. So we can either you know, sort of say, let's stop working until more money comes in the door, which I think, again, we can't do, and we can't let kids go. But if we can show, with scarce resources, how much we're improving, how much we're getting better, and frankly, how much more we could do, then I think we have a chance. I'm very worried in this really tough economy that I, one of the big things I keep arguing for is more time. Longer days, longer weeks, longer years. Again, particularly for disadvantaged children, we don't need another study on summer reading loss. We know children from disadvantaged communities often come to us, teachers do a great job, they get to this point by June, and they come back in September, and they're here. They're further behind than when they left. That is heartbreaking. Children, certain children need 11 months out of the year, you know, 12 hours a day. That takes more money. That takes longer days. Right now, we have school districts going the opposite way. Less time, cutting out subjects, nailing the curriculum, going to four-day weeks. What chance do those children have? And so it's a very tough economic time to have this, but I'm going to continue to push. And I think the best way we get there is trying to get better results with scarce resources and demonstrate this is the right investment to make. Carol Kolbeck, Dean of Education at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I appreciate very much what you're saying about shining a spotlight and providing additional support for those schools and districts that are doing well. I'm concerned when you say that those aren't doing well need to close. So I'm in a competition, even if you're rewarding those who are collaborating, what happens to those who don't win? And how are we going to use our resources to help support those who haven't figured out how to do it well? And again, I've never said something has to close. What I've said is things have to change. So that's a very important distinction. It's not, this is not about closing. It's about challenging the status quo. And there are lots of ways to challenge the status quo without closing schools. There are lots of schools that get dramatically better that don't close. What I'm saying is, though, we cannot no longer be passive and say 50, 60, 70% dropout rates are okay. That's what I'm challenging. What we're trying to do, it's a really fair question. So we're going to have race to the top the first round, and we're going to have some winners, and we're frankly going to have a lot more losers than winners. Then we're going to come back with the second round. We want folks to continue to improve. And then what we've asked for in next year's FY11 budget is another $1.35 billion to hopefully have a third round. And so what we want to do is we want to get a set of places that can help lead us where we need to go and demonstrate success. None of this is proprietary. Everyone should be talking. Again, this is not about competition. This is about folks figuring out what's working. Folks that can get there in the second round, great. Folks that can get there in the third round, great. We want to continue to come back with these opportunities. And I think what folks haven't understood is how many opportunities are out there. $4 billion in race to the top now. Another $1.35 billion hopefully coming. $3.5 billion, and this is the thing, you know, public hasn't got it, $3.5 billion in school improvement grants just for the bottom 5% of schools. Mass, so everyone said we don't have resources. Well, we're bringing resources to these schools. We're going to add time. We're going to do some things. We want to work with teachers. But not doing anything is not the answer. Invest in innovation, $650 million. So we are blessed at a time when resources are absolutely constrained to have lots and lots of money to put out there behind places, again, who want to get better. You don't have to have the best of track records. Show us where you want to go. Show us your commitment to getting there. Show us your capacity, and we want to help you get there. My name is Greg Wickersham. I'm a master's student here at the School of Education. 
you mentioned English language learners, and so I just wanted to ask a more specific question. Um, like, uh, one of the flaws in the current No Child Left Behind laws is if, a, if an English language learner <coughs> passes their English language proficiency test, they then leave the subgroup, <coughs> and right, so the, right. the school can't really get credit for their improvement. Are there plans to change that and other plans to, to alter the, when, when that goes up for reauthorization to change that to w that law to make you know, maybe include all language minority students in the subgroup or other, other plans that you have to regarding English language learners and, the, and, and race to the top and such? Short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're really aware of those, those challenges, and um, I'll tell you that the woman who's in charge of my sort of K-12 education, Thelma Melendez, who is a superintendent of the year coming from California. She's a former ELL student herself. Um, she had lots of challenges of folks telling her what she couldn't do, and she was told by counselors not to go to college. It wasn't for her. Obviously went to college, got her PhD, has done pretty darn well. So this one's pretty personal for her, and uh, we're going to try and do some things that hopefully you'll be really proud of. I'm Susan Moore, John. Um, faculty member at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and um, Good to see glad you. to see you. Um, I, my question actually follows a bit on Paul Toner's question about Central Falls High School uh, and, and what has been going on there. It, I intensely watch issues of teacher quality and efforts to improve teacher quality. And I see in that school district, but probably in other places along the road, uh, a kind of perfect storm brewing as we see the conflict of race to the top requirements, collective bargaining laws in the states, collective bargaining agreements in the districts, and then state tenure laws and tenure assurances that districts have. So when we read about the firing of teachers, we have to wonder what, on what basis that happened and is it being triggered primarily by the race to the top application um, by dissatisfaction with the tenure laws, by dissatisfaction with the collective bargaining agreements. So my question is really, as you look down the road, do, how do you see reconciling the federal, state, and local responsibilities and also the political priorities and the educational priorities with the legal constraints? There's a lot there. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm least interested in is the political priorities. <laughs> What I'm really interested in is the students and the children's priorities. And again, I don't know, you know, beginning all the specifics there. Um, as I said, as we speak now, I do know that adults on both sides are talking and hopefully, you know, can, can work this thing through and continue to work together. What I'm ch trying to challenge the country to do, and again, whether that's the right example or not, where we have schools, I'm repeating myself, but where we have schools where year after year after year, the majority of students have no chance of success in life, our country has been far too silent. Under No Child Left Behind, nothing changed. Nothing changed. And I have a problem with that. Everyone was labeled a failure. Lots of schools were labeled failures were actually improving, were getting better. They were mislabeled. I have a problem with that. There are lots of schools that weren't you know, great but were getting better. We need to better support them. But there were some at the bottom that things weren't getting better, and that didn't get addressed. So I missed everything. I missed the ones getting better, missed the ones in the middle, missed the ones at the bottom. What I'm trying to say is let's have an honest national conversation. Let's all move outside our comfort zones, management, union, everybody, and say, can we better serve children? And whether it's that school or whether it's, you know, uh, and again, my question would be, would you or I send our child to that school? And if we can't answer that affirmatively, how do we all work together to come up with an answer? And so we're going to challenge management, challenge union, challenge state boards, states, our local superintendents. Let's have these conversations and let's put it on the table. No one was talking about this school <laughs> before the other day. I'm, you know, we need to have a productive conversation. We need to work together. I'm glad we're thinking about a community where more than half the kids are dropping out every year. I think we need to have that conversation. Great. A second tweet, Jessica. Federal, sorry. What role should the federal government play in not just promoting K to 12 common standards, standards and accountability? Yeah, you're gonna get me in trouble with this audience. <laughs> um, I think the big thing that, that's been interesting to me on the, the uh, K to 12 standards, to be real clear, is if these are federal standards, if these are national standards, this thing dies. That, that doesn't work. This has to be done at the local level. What's happening is you have 48 state governors, 48 state school chiefs, heads of both unions working together to make this happen. So it's about college and career ready standards. It's not about a federal mandate. And they're driving this thing on their own. 
And so I think where you have great folks stepping up and being successful and trying to raise the bar for all students, we want that. I'll tell you in the higher education side, again, I'm very interested in looking not just in access. We're pushing very, very hard to, to get there. We want to put a huge amount of money behind that. We have a bill, it's the Safra bill, the higher ed bill that's passed the House before the Senate. We want to take $87 billion, stop subsidizing banks, put it into education. That's controversial. That's been very interesting to watch. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but at the end of the day, what we want to do is part of that, that the savings there by taking money away from banks, we want to put a lot of money behind universities that are doing a better job of building a college completion culture. And it's pretty interesting. Universities, obviously this, this university has a phenomenal track record, but we have uh, universities across the country that with very similar students have very different outcomes. Students who are first generation or ELL come from poverty families. Some universities do a great job and some don't. I will tell you, one of the things I did in Chicago is we started to track this data very closely, and it was fascinating. And we honestly started to steer students away from certain universities and towards others based upon their proven ability to help our students graduate. And so we want to put a lot of resources, a college called the College Access and Completion Fund, $2.5 billion behind those places that want to build a culture around attainment, not just around access. My name is Tina Collins. I'm a postdoc here at the Ed School. And uh, my question is about school segregation, uh, which has historically uh, been a huge interest of the federal government. Um, and uh, the levels of segregation in uh, northern schools, in particular in southern schools, where federal mandates for uh, desegregation have been lifted over the last 25 years or so. Um, have increased dramatically yeah. uh, recently. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about what the administration's policies are going to be in terms of addressing that and whether you see that as connecting uh, to the issues of opportunity and achievement that you're working on addressing through Race to the Top. I, I absolutely see it as addressing those issues. And um, we've brought in a, a woman, Ruslan Ali, who's an absolute dynamo, who's leading our Office of Civil Rights. and. I don't want to get ahead of her, but uh, very soon <laughs> uh, we're going to lay out some of the things we want to do here. I will tell you, I worry about this issue a lot. Um, I think it is so hugely important for children to grow up around people different from them, different backgrounds, race, class, socioeconomic status. Um, I think when students don't have those opportunities, it makes it much harder for them to be successful in a diverse society, in a diverse community, in a diverse world going forward. And I've seen students who had all the academic preparation, but who didn't have those kinds of opportunities to grow up with people who weren't just like them. And they struggle in the bigger world. And I think we set them up again um, for less than optimal chances for success about those opportunities. I think how every day, how blessed I was to grow up in an integrated community. I know how unusual that is for far too many of our students around the country. So whatever, we, and again, I don't, and these things are hard to teach in algebra and biology. This is stuff you learn at recess, in the hallways, at, in the cafeteria, spending time on the weekends with friends. And so whatever we can do to increase integration, I want to try and figure out how we do it. It's not something you can mandate or force. It's not force busing. That, you know, that's, not, you know, that's not where you're going to get there. But what incentives, how do you create opportunities, and how do you uh, create an environment where this is valued, where folks understand how important it is, and where you give students a, ch a chance that I think is just an invaluable part of their education, that there's no, I don't know how else you get there. And in, um, I think in many places, and this relates to you know, housing patterns and everything, to your point, we're seeing a resegregation. We're seeing this go the right, wrong way, not the right way. So we have to think about how we start to turn those, those trends. And um, over the next couple of weeks, uh, Russell and Lee is going to do some, do some stuff that uh, hopefully you'll like. I can go without a mic. Uh, you asked me to claim my affiliations. I've got a lot, but I'll claim two that are most dear to my heart for this conversation. 3,400 blocks in Southern California, and I've been a, a high school teacher in New Southern for 18 years. And, you know, a lot of the things you said I'd like to see happen, but one of the, one of the places I want to push you a little bit um, to get some of your thinking is around, I would agree that, that teachers are one of the key X factors to getting us you know, in the, to the place where we're, we're reaching a lot of these goals that you're talking about. 
But what I'm curious about is, is what is your vision for how you will evaluate teachers beyond just test scores, right? Because we know certainly through all of our research that there are a set of preconditions that teachers develop with young people that often lead to those test scores that we're looking for. But I haven't heard a lot about a, a kind of dynamic evaluation tool that would be looking at teachers in this kind of comprehensive way to begin talking about what a quote unquote highly qualified teacher is. Thank you. Great question, and I'm actually trying to shift it from highly qualified, which is based upon paper credentials, to highly effective. And I think the you can have four degrees, but if your students aren't learning, it doesn't matter. If you have no degrees, but your students are learning, that's, I want more of those teachers. So there's a fundamental shift there. But your question's a really good one. Anytime you say teachers should be evaluated 100% on a test score, I think you're crazy. Anytime you say teachers shouldn't be evaluated at all on student achievement, I also think you're crazy. I think there's a middle ground here that folks have to get to. And I've said repeatedly that you have to look at multiple assessments. I'm a big fan of peer evaluations. I think teachers evaluating teachers are often much more effective than other folks. I don't see how a principal who watches one class for 15 minutes a year can begin to evaluate there. What leadership opportunities are teachers taking on? What are they doing to contribute to that school's environment? And so like any person in any profession, and teaching is an absolutely value profession, you have to look at multiple indicators. No, you know, no one in any other career is based upon, you know, is their evaluation based upon one number. Doesn't happen. And we have, what I've also said is in many, many places, teacher evaluations are honestly broken. They don't identify talent, they don't help teachers in the middle, and they don't weed out those that don't work. So if it's not working for any adults, it's not working for students either. You have a set of places that are starting to break through. And going back to Paul's point, real union management collaboration, thoughtful evaluations, comprehensive, holistic looking at a range of factors. And where that's happening, teachers are happier, <laughs> they improve, and guess what? Good things are happening for students. And so as a country, I think we have a long way to go. I think there are some phenomenal models out there, but this is an area of teacher evaluation where we have to, um, we have to get a lot better. Uh, don't have to create it from scratch. Again, some wonderful models out there, done absolutely in partnership. Um, but I've never, ever said it should be one test score. Doesn't make any sense at all. All right, so we have time for one more question. Um, but before we go to that, I just want to thank you all. These were terrific questions. Thank you, Secretary Duncan, um, for your inspiring words, for your insights into this work, which is clearly very, very personal to you and to many, many, all of us. Um, and just to, get, you know, to the extent that you continue to have questions and the conversation spills over, I view that as a good sign. So thank you very much. And right after this last question, I'm going to turn it back over to Dean McCartney to close out the session. Okay, so who's got the burning questions? Got to be asked. <laughs> okay, gentlemen there, the glass is right in the middle. Yes. Grad School of Ed Arts and Education program, and my question is about the arts and education. And um, as you know, under No Child Left Behind, the arts are designated as a core subject or a core discipline. And I'm just wondering about the administration's vision yeah. about that going forward. It hasn't really been a priority, and um, if there's going to be any difference coming up on that. Thank you. It's a huge priority. I will tell you, I talk about traveling in 37 states and rural, urban, suburban, and hundreds and hundreds of schools maybe the largest or loudest or most consistent complaint I had was about a narrowing of the curriculum and a No Child Left Behind. They had a focus on reading and math, which is obviously very important, but everything else got sort of swept aside. If it wasn't tested, it didn't get taught. And so whether it's the STEM areas, whether it's the arts, um, whether it's science, whether it's social studies, I'm a big fan of PE and recess. I think kids need to run around more. <laughs> Um, we need to find out, we need to push hard to get a much more well-rounded education. When I talked about six pillars, I didn't go through them. One of our buckets of funding that we want to do going forward is called a well-rounded education, well-rounded curriculum. It's a billion dollars there. We've added a hundred million dollars there, a 10% increase again in time when there's not a lot of money. And we just want to put a lot of money behind places that want to look in all these areas. Um, and to me, it's really important. Often folks talk about this at the high school level, and it's hugely important there in robotic and debate and arts and drama and dance. I think we have to do this in the primary grades. I think students have to find their passion. They have to have a chance to develop their skills and self-esteem. I would say I didn't necessarily go to school every day because I loved biology. I went because I wanted to play in a basketball team, and to do that, you had to do well academically. And so maybe it's the dance troupe, maybe it's the band, maybe it's chorus, maybe it's 
debate, maybe it's robotics. We have to provide those opportunities. We have to provide them to young children so they find out what they love and what motivates them to go to school. So we're putting a huge amount of resources behind this and want to work, work with folks who, okay, yes, the basics of reading and math are hugely important, but we've got to do a lot more and we've got to do it starting at the earliest of ages. Thank you so much. One announcement, and that is I need to ask you all to stay seated once we leave so that Secretary Duncan and his team can leave. And um, I just uh, want to say to Arnie, I'm, I'm so proud to be a member of this community, and I, I think now as a member of our visiting committee, you're, you're well aware of, of just how passionately people care. Uh, there's a diversity of opinions about uh, education reform, but what really unites us is uh, the desire to improve the lives of learners. And I think we all heard that in your comments today. Uh, we want you to know that we are here to support you in your work and that you may call on members of this community to help you and we will rise to that challenge. So please join me once again in thanking Secretary Duncan for his <laughs> wonderful comments. <laughs>